Senator Jared Rennick, thanks for being here. Hey, you going, Leo? Good, thanks. Great to have you here. So you were dumped from a winnable LNP Senate spot more than a year ago now. Why have you waited until this moment, August 2024, to actually quit the party? Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, there are a number of regularities that occurred in the Senate pre-selection, uh, and I wanted the ballot held again, uh, as did Peter Dutton. He asked the uh, state executive to hold it again. Uh, they didn't do it. Um, I felt that the rules of the Constitution weren't upheld. I took it to court, uh, and the court ruled that political parties aren't justiciable. Now, I actually wanted to test that in court because I have a real issue with the fact that people who make the laws are above the law, uh, and unfortunately the judge uh, who was bound by other courts, I should make, make it clear, uh, ruled that basically political parties uh, and their constitutions aren't justiciable. Right. And so in terms of this new party that you formed, I know you're calling yourself an independent. I get the Senate rules, but for those who might not understand those and, you know, they were only changed eight years ago, just explain why that party formation is necessary for wanting to run for re-election as you are. Yeah, thanks, Leo. That's a good question. Ideally, I wouldn't want to start a party because it obviously involves a lot of administration and, I, and, you know, let's assume that I don't get back in next year. I'd I'd much prefer to speak just about policy for the next eight months. But in order to uh, be above the line in the Senate, when you vote in the Senate, there's above the line and below the line. Only political parties, registered political parties, can go above the line. Uh, if you run as a, a genuine independent with no party affiliation, your name will be below the line amongst possibly, you know, it's, it's a guess. We don't know how many people will run for the Senate, but there's generally over 100, if not 200 people that run in a Senate. I mean, they call the Senate ballot a tablecloth. Uh, so ideally to have the best chance uh, of getting re-elected, you really want your name above the line. As well as that, if you vote above the line, you've only got a number one to six above the line, whereas below the line, you've got a number one to 12. So there's a greater chance of making a mistake and voting informal. But just to be clear, just again, for those, because I, I, I have seen like a lot of questions since you've made this announcement um, from, you know, your potential voters, um, just no plans at all to go anywhere with this party other than purely to get your name above the line. So no, no one candidate in the lower house, no other states. It's just for just for your re-election well campaign. The intention is just for my re-election. I may run candidates in lower house seats here in Queensland so that in order to actually get people to help give how to vote cards, but I'm not planning on running many. I have been approached by a number of people from other states who want to run. I'm not keen on that idea because it's just I just don't have the capacity to manage uh, such a large uh, undertaking. Yeah, all right. Uh, now, I know in, in 2019 when you were uh, elected, I know that that's a while back when you consider, you know, a week is a long time in politics. We can go back to 2019 here. Um, but in terms of below the line votes, you got less than 2,000. You were safely elected yeah. because of that uh, above the line LNP vote, which got you in. Um, what makes you think you're going to be able to get enough personal appeal to make that quota, which I think is more than 400,000 in Queensland, even considering preferences. That, that's a lot of votes that you're going to have to make up one way or another. Yeah, that's a good question, Leo. Well, I don't actually think I will get enough votes to reach that quota. But what I wanted to do, I had a lot of people approach me and ask me to run. Uh, and I'm the sort of person that will never say die. So had I stayed in the Liberal Party for the last eight months, I would have been um, constrained by the party rules about not speaking out on policy or going solo on policy. By doing this, I, I felt that I could get a bigger platform to promote the issues that I originally ran in Parliament for, which was around taxation reform, monetary policy reform, uh, reforming the bureaucracy, the duplication of bureaucracies between the state and federal government. So that's what I want to do in the last eight to 10 months is run with the issues. Now, I'll obviously try to be re-elected, um, but, you know, look, I don't have any tickets on myself in the sense that I think I'm, I've am i got a, a, a great chance. I mean, I, I am curious to see just how much that me social media following converts into votes. Um, but I, I, my expectations, you know, it, is that I just want to run hard on those issues that I came into Parliament to do in the first place because obviously I've been distracted by a few other things, namely COVID uh, and a couple of other things over a few years. So I'd like to finish up where, where I began, which is taxation and monetary reform. Was there any ever ever any discussions or considerations about joining a, a, a minor party like One Nation, the UAP, the Libertarians? Has that ever popped up in the last you know year since you lost that winnable spot? 
Oh, I've been approached by all the other parties over over the years about joining them. Uh, and, and you know, look, we definitely need to consolidate the minor parties. There's no question about that. But I just wanted to run as an independent uh, so I could focus on policy issues and not party issues. Obviously, I've come out of a bruising pre-selection uh, and I'm kind of sick of dealing with party issues. I actually want to serve the people, I put the people first uh, and talk about policies that can make, you know, lead to a better life for Australians. And you are obviously running against, the, there'll be a number of incumbents up for election from 2019 uh, next year. And we look, we expect the election to be next year. I'm doubting there'll be a double dissolution. Um, one of the people you are running against, though, will be uh, Malcolm Roberts, the One Nation incumbent. Do you not risk, I guess, sp- even with preferences, splitting the vote enough that could cause, you know, Roberts to miss the quota and get someone like legalised cannabis up? I know they were close in 2022. Is that a, a risk? And I mean, even you said yourself, right, I get you're practically an independent for all things other than the above the line than the Senate. But even you've said, right, you need to consolidate minor parties to some extent. Yeah, it is a risk, um, but it would have also been a risk if I hadn't have run because not everyone will vote uh, for one nation first. So I, I give people, so for example, last time, and I'm not sure if the UAP are running this time or not, but last time I don't time think they, they can with their registration at all, actually. So, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, okay, well, I'm, I'm, yeah. anyway, so if they didn't run, for example, there's 4% of people out there that would, didn't necessarily want to vote for uh, One Nation last time that want, don't necessarily want to vote for the Liberal Party, the Coalition either. So I'm actually, I, I think by running that we can increase the vote for both myself and Malcolm, the cumulative, and, make, and, and combine it into two votes, whereas if I didn't, sort of two people, whereas if I didn't run, uh, then a lot of people might have gone to other parties and that vote would have been diluted. Now, the other thing that, and, and many of your listeners may not understand, is you don't have to get a full quota. So you've got to remember six years ago, or well, five and a half years ago, both myself and Malcolm got in. Admittedly, I was under the LNP uh, branding set then, but you don't need a full quota. So our quotas for that, my third spot quota under the LNP and Malcolm's quota was about 0.72 each, or about 10% of the vote, and then preferences pulled Malcolm up to about 15, and I think I got to 13. So if, if say, for example, I'd have joined with One Nation, that would have meant that Malcolm would have to get 14% before before votes started coming to me. So rather than getting, say, over the line, the two of us with about 20 22% of the vote, you'd need it to closer to 28% of the vote to get the two of us over if we're on the same ticket. So it's actually provided that we can work together, myself and Malcolm, which we will, because it's going on very well, uh, it, it, I actually think it'll focus the minor parties to all other minor parties to make sure they preference us as well. Yeah, and look, we'll be watching with keen interest as to uh, as to which parties do run and, and how those preference recommendations all flow. Um, you've touched on it a bit um, throughout the past few answers, but really, what are the issues that you're going to be talking about um, for the next few months? Um, again, let's assume no double disillusion. Um, what are you really going to be focusing on? Both, I guess as a, a current senator as you are, and then during that uh, election campaign period? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Leo. So effectively, I've come up with five key policies. There's a number of other policies that I'll discuss uh, later on, um, but I want to focus on those five key policies. Number one is that I want, and, and they, all of these policies are designed to empower the individual and, and the family uh, and put more money back into their pocket because what we've seen over the last few decades uh, is basically an erosion of people's personal choice and responsibility. So the first one, I've always been passionate about this as someone who's worked in accounting and tax. Uh, I've always felt that the worker should get a tax deduction for the cost of living. If businesses can get a tax deduction for the cost of business, people who get up, uh, put their nose, get out of bed and put their nose to the grindstone should be able to get a tax deduction for the cost of living. Uh, and I think it's ridiculous to tax people when they're below earning less than the cost of living. So I want to raise that tax-free threshold to $40,000, and that will work out at about a $3,500 more money into people's pockets. The second thing that I want to do is actually uh, also pay childcare directly to the families. Uh, There are millions of shift workers in this country who don't have access um, to, uh, um, you know, the childcare centres between 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. So if you're a shift worker like a nurse or a policeman or work in hospitality or a transport driver, you can't necessarily pick your child up at 6 o'clock at night. Uh, you could be someone that works part-time for three hours a day. Why do you pay for 12 hours of childcare? You could be someone that lives on a farm. You can't you don't have the time to drive 
half an hour, an hour into town every day, drop the child off, drive back, and then four hours later, drive in again. Um, so they need nannies. You know, it'd be much more suitable to have nannies. Uh, and there's also people that much rather prefer to, to pay the child's grandparents to look after the children rather than and the grandparent can come to the house rather than drop the child off at the childcare centre. So we need to give a lot more flexibility in how people are you know, allowed to um, raise their children if they want to get government support. The third one is to make superannuation optional. Yet again, you know, if Paul Keating in 1992 went to a referendum and said, by 2025, I'm going to take 12% of your income and give it to someone you've never met until he's 67, uh, do you think people would have voted for it? I don't think so. So uh, we've still got the same percentage of retirees on a full pension today, 50% is what we did in 1992. So despite for the $50 billion in tax concessions for superannuation that go to the mainly upper 25%, uh, that that is basically incurred uh, rather than get people off the pension, which only costs, well, I say only $54 billion uh, for the, the people, uh, the 50% of retirees on low income. So I don't think it's very effective. And as well as that, it costs $30 billion a year uh, for paper shufflers to just manage other people's money. So we want to empower the individual to pay off their house or pay off their hex debt faster, which in my view, owning your house as you go into retirement is much more, you know, is the first thing you've got to do. Uh, because if you own your house, at least you've got some, a roof over your head going into retirement. Number four is to help pay for those tax cuts, abolish renewable subsidies for renewables, as well as abol abolish renewables on farmland, uh, oceans and national parks. If you want to have solar panels on your house or your industrial, you know, your business, whatever, that's cool. Um, and then the fifth one is to bring back a retail bank, an infrastructure bank, and to pay for a government insurance office. All right. Well, look, it's going to be really interesting a few months ahead, as we said, and, and look forward to seeing how things go. Senator Jared Rennick, thanks very much for your time, and I'm sure we'll catch up again in the future. Yeah, thanks very much, Leo. Have a great day.